Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast. Here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father of six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going? Jake, doing good. Another week and a half. Got the live event coming down. We got six tickets left, Jake. Um, November 11th and 12th in Knoxville, downtown Hilton. Uh, hit us up, Gino, Jake, and Gino.com if you want any info for those tickets. We've only got six left. We've got 160 people signed up so far, Jake. It's going to be a great event. So supply and demand, are you charging double now? Mm, nah, not really. Not like that. You know how we are, bro. We give everything away for free. So. <laughs> okay, so before we get this one kicked off, let's give a quick shout out to our sponsor, CrowdStreet, who knows you don't have to know a guy to find a quality commercial real estate investment opportunity. Learn more at CrowdStreet.com backslash wheelbarrow. And for visiting their site, they're going to give you a free gift. Kind of like you, Gino. Always giving everything away for free, man. You got to give it away, bro. Reciprocity. <laughs> Today's guest is Dan Summers. Dan is the CEO of Realty Evest, an online platform for real estate crowdfunding. In 2013, Dan realized that the syndication floodgates were open with the passage of the Jobs Act following the general solic uh, solicitation of securities. Since then, Dan entered that sandbox and never looked back. So without further ado, Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, Dan, how you doing? Good, Jim. You know, how are you? I'm good. So, Dan, why don't you, you know, give us a little bit about your real estate background before we get into the platform? Sure. Uh, there's really nothing little about it. I started this platform, near uh, this industry, nearly 40 years ago. I've never been in anything other than real estate. I started back in Chicago in 1978 as a real estate broker downtown Chicago, basically brokering uh, multifamily deals. Uh, back when the three principals at Inland Realty, we all know who Inland is, the Costanzas, et cetera, were buying and selling multi uh, uh, what we call fourplexes in, in Chicago. We got to know them quite well. So that's how far back I go. And I brokered uh, real estate downtown Chicago for about six years and then uh, elected to move down to sunny San Antonio, Texas to help a classmate of mine run a savings loan during the 1980s. And as a result of the Graham St. Germain Act from President, first President Bush that allowed sponsors and developers to co-invest into savings alone, the entire industry was in an upheaval. So that particular savings alone was holding about a billion dollars in REO. And I was invited to go down there and help work our way through that. It took six years to get uh, through that mess. We got the SNL turned around completely and a lot of multifamily. That was really my big uh, introduction to multifamily from the lending side. We turned that around and I left for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where uh, I started my company at that point in time, 1992. I uh, ran it for about 10 years. We accumulated about a billion dollars in real estate. We took it public uh, in 99, about 2000, kind of the end of the pie eating contest, if you will. We ran one of the very last IPOs, uh, retired for the first time, uh, came out of retirement a few years thereafter to help a group in principal equity. In uh, Houston, Texas, we built that up to a billion dollar company over about six years, retired for the second time. <laughs> And then we got together with a couple of ex-Goldman and Lehman brother guys a number of years ago and started buying multifamily down here in the southeast, down in the tertiary and secondary markets, which is where I basically have always bought real estate, undervalued real estate. And then about four years ago, uh, crowdfunding came across my radar, and frankly, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. We shelved all the properties and the partnerships, and I sat back for a year. I tracked the industry and then decided I jumped in with both feet. So three years later, three and a half years later, we've got Realty Evest going uh, very successfully, and we're adding some new platforms as we speak. So, Jake, I'm, I'm, I'm going to 
the introduction is my, my wife kind of says when I open up the refrigerator and the light goes on, I do 15 minutes. So I apologize. <laughs> I'm with you. I, I don't want to leave. You know, there's some good no, stuff in there. <laughs> no, th this is great. We're going to unpack this whole thing. But the first question to start it all off is why multifamily? You know, uh, multifamily for me is easy because I can define all the moving parts. There's a lot of consistency with multifamily. For my particular industry, I always bought value add. My value, value add play was real simple, okay? It's a class B-ish kind of property in a class A-ish kind of market, pretty simple. Stay off the radar. So I went down into Mobile, I went to Gainesville, I went to Huntsville, I bought in secondary markets. And I'm only dealing with one year leases, so it's pretty simple to define all the moving parts. The operating expenses are what they are, okay? I buy mismanaged properties. I can look at line items and tell you if they're within three or 4% of where they should be. So within a, a couple of hours, I can more or less figure out the entire value add play, obviously subject to walking each unit, but at the end of the day, the numbers are what they are. I never buy on a cap rate going in, but I always sell on a cap rate going out. So it's a three-year deal. It takes two years to go through the evolution, revolution of a, of a rent roll, start from the front to the back, and then the third year is a trailing 12, and I sell my deals as a and on a trailing 12 cap rate. So it's pretty simple stuff to tell you the truth. Do you remember your first deal? Yeah, I do. I what do. was it? Uh, mid 1980s, uh, Austin, Texas. I joined up with the mattress king of Los Angeles. <laughs> I was a young <laughs> pup without two nickels to rub together, but I knew the industry, was introduced to this gentleman and he said, look, I'll put up the money We'll do a 50-50, which was awfully generous uh, partnership. Um, we lived in San Antonio at the time. It's at the tail end of my savings and loan career. And uh, we took three years. We did just as I said, a great location, B property, A location, went in and uh, attacked the mismanagement, moving parts, the expenses, pushed the rents uh, year two. Uh, we had it stabilized, ran it for a year, sold it on a trailing 12 and uh, got out, moved up to Pittsburgh. The Rust Belt. Wow. So what, yeah, the what, what, markets you, what markets are you looking at right now? Or what markets do you think would, would be really good for an investor right now to, to be uh, looking at? Anywhere the big guys aren't. Okay. And that's getting harder and harder as we speak. Uh, once again, you know, my equation, Gainesville, okay, as an example. We own a lot in Gainesville. A couple of years ago, four or five years ago, we started buying there. And you got two huge forces there. You have obviously the university mm -hmm. and you have shams, okay? And they're not building any new products. So we were able to get in there and buy some situations. We knew that we could renovate the properties. We knew we had a, 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 a rent roll that could be built internally from the, the students and obviously the, um, the residents at the, the hospital. Uh, we like Huntsville. Most people don't understand Huntsville as an example. Huntsville has more engineers per capita than anywhere else in the entire United States. Um, the household income is higher. It's for $58,000 per household. It's one of the highest in the entire United States also. So those are the kind of markets I like. I like uh, Mobile, obviously, with the opening of the Panama Canal. Uh, blew open the, the ability to uh, import uh, more product. I like Hattiesburg. You have one railway going out of Mobile and four railways leaving Hattiesburg. Uh, so they're getting all the imported cargo from Mobile. There's a 2,500 acre distribution center that's just being finished. And they've got four rail railways leading out of Hattiesburg. It's pretty simple stuff. Plus, you have the university. So that's the kind of stuff you, I look for. It's not a, you know, it's not a Miami. It's not a Chicago. It's not a, even an Orlando. But it's a solid market, and you can bank the future. So what mistakes do you see today? You've been doing this for 40 years. If you had to say a couple big mistakes guys are making today, what would you, what would you pinpoint? Forcing deals. The cap rates are so compressed across the market. They're sitting with equity. There's a lot of capital out there, as we all know, and they're forcing deals. They're, they, they feel compelled to buy a deal. I mean, I'm seeing deals in, in Jacksonville, Florida, where my office is here, trading at just above a, cap, a five cap rate. That's insane, all right? <laughs> so these investors, they call me constantly and brokers call me constantly with off-market deals, whatever that means anymore. <laughs> and, and they're trying to force deals. So 
you know, it doesn't make sense. Sit back, sit back and wait. Don't force your capital into an industry that is, has a feeding frenzy going on, put it that way. Dan, I have a quick story to, to tell you and the listeners. I tried to get down to Jacksonville in August of 2015. I missed the market by six months because I couldn't sell my house. We had a prominent figure on our show telling me that I was crazy buying in Jacksonville. That's a crazy market. And I thought the same thing you did. I had an inkling that Amazon was coming down. I knew jobs were here. I mean, it was just unbelief beneath the institutional radar. A year later, this prominent guy is buying stuff in Jacksonville. So if he had listened to me, he probably would have bought stuff a lot cheaper. But now he's the guy saying, hey, I'm buying in Jacksonville now where he was scoffing at at our idea to buy so i i totally 100 percent agree with you staying below beneath that radar yeah look for trends uh jacksonville is a great example you know uh you know with the fulfillment center going in a lot of people don't realize how vibrant jacksonville florida is the fulfillment center is next to the airport 1400 new jobs uh, you've got Budweiser, you've got Bacardi Rum, and you've got Swisher Sweets, the largest cigar factory in the world, all in the northeast section of Jacksonville. What a mm -hmm. great place. We actually have a, a crowdfunding client of ours we're raising capital for is putting up a new townhome development right in the middle of it. It's like, wow, what a great location, what a great opportunity. So, yeah, it's looking at all the moving parts and staying below the radar where the big guys aren't going. What's changed over your career, over the 40 years that you think in your industry, other than this crowdfunding platform, what, what do you see that's changed? It's a great question. Obviously, the technology has changed, and the, abil the ability to make decisions is much faster. When I took my company public, I had 147 full-time employees. If I had that company today, I could run the same company with 10 employees. So the ability to make, because of technology, snap wow. decisions, You've got so much data at your fingertips immediately versus the old days when, you know, it was it was prior to um, CoStar and, and so on. It was just a lot of labor. The immediacy of information is staggering as opposed to back in the 70s and the 80s and even the early 90s. So a lot gets done in a very short period of time. So you've got to be able to react fast. This is not. This is not a, a, a one on one game. This is a big boy game if you really want to get into the industry, because you have to be a well capitalized and b be able to dance in the balls of your feet and make pretty quick decisions quickly. Dan, what do you think about this nonsense we just talked about a couple minutes ago with these off market deals? Uh, Jake and I keep coming up against this where the guys coming in saying they're direct to the buyer and uh, to the seller and all. Has, have you gone through this in your in your career early on? In my oh, early on? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay, because I see LinkedIn as being a problem with this. Guys put deals on, and I mean, so what would you do with that instance? What do you do? Because we're having trouble breaking through, trying to get through to the, you know, to the principal. I mean, what is your advice on that on a situation like that? Well, you know, if you're trying to get through to the principal, that's different. That's a laborious, long endeavor that takes a long time, and unless you know the principals, which is difficult to do nowadays, mm -hmm. have a have a track record experience with those individuals. It's an uphill battle, if not impossible. You're going to get old and gray like me before you start cranking deals. <laughs> so, you know, the best advice is um, the brokerage community has always been good to me, if you're good to them. A, you got to be known as not being a retrader, all right? So if you're a retrader, the brokerage community talks, and they know that you're going to come in at X, and then you're going to retrade them at the last second, and no one likes that, okay? My reputation in the industry has been, I don't retrade, man. I go in with my best number, and unless there's something structural uh, or, or a financial issue, it is what it is. But I would get my half a dozen brokers, solid brokers within the industry, and I'd get to know them well. Make sure they know that, you know, you can perform. Performance is, performance is the difference between success and not being successful. And in the broker's eye, if you can pull the trigger, and you have pulled the trigger historically, you're going to get their attention. Let's face it, it's all about making money. At the end of the day, they have enough friends and you have enough friends. They're not looking for more friends. This is about making money. So if you can so prove true. to them that you can pull the trigger, you don't retrade, okay, you're going to get their attention. It's that simple. It's performance. Mm -hmm. So Jake and I uh, always hear this question. Well, I've never done a deal before. How do I get my credibility? How do I get into that first deal? Can you walk us through your very first deal and how you got credibility and how you got somebody to give you 50-50 uh, with no money down? Because that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it was a stroke of luck. Uh, <laughs> it's coming out of an industry, the savings loan industry, that gave me tremendous credibility. So, you know, 
you, you've got to have a stellar reputation in whatever capacity you're working. And you've got to be able to pull references. So your credibility and your history, your knowledge has got to be there. And don't try to do a 200, 250 deal, unit deal as your first deal, which I was fortuitous enough to do. Uh, but, I, you know, get that greed gland smaller and look for a smaller deal in your own community. Make sure that you know you know your numbers. You you know the deal inside and out. There's a lot of capital out there. All right. The difference today versus then is that there's so much capital out there that the the the, the rates are being driven down. Okay. But there's so many deals out there and so many investors you're competing about. It's you know it's it's a mismatch. So it's tough. It's 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 a, it's a difficult chore. So a build up your credibility slowly. In whatever industry you're in, uh, get out and schmooze and get to meet the investors, get to meet, go to these conferences, press the flesh. And it just takes time. There's nothing happens overnight in this business. And if you want it to happen overnight in this business, it ain't going to happen. So if you had to pull out your crystal ball, what do you think the future holds? Because I keep telling people it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. When are these cap rates going to come back up and when are things going to slow down and when is the capital going to dry up and go to gold or go to something else? What do you see happening in the future? Look, uh, there's a great book called The Tipping Point. Put it on your read list. It's tremendous. And what it talks about is when all of the stars are aligned and things are going really good, when do you hit that pinnacle? When do you? When does it tip? When does it go over the edge, both, you know, successfully or a downward slope? You know, what's that pinnacle that has to happen? And in the real estate industry, especially multifamily, there's a couple of moving parts here. So the metrics are this, uh, GDP, gross domestic product, uh, when that's ticking up, you're going to see vacancy rates ticking down and rentals ticking up. So keep your eye on those metrics. When the GDP starts to slump a little bit and vacancies start to cre up, create, uh, go up a little bit and vacancy uh, and rental rates slow down, you're hitting that tipping point, and that's when it's going to be a downward slope. And conversely, it's true, too. So keep your eye on those metrics, and that's a pretty good telltale. Wow, well, I don't know when that's going to happen. Whew. Um, that crowdfunding, what got you into crowdfunding? I could talk about multifamily with you all day, but I, I want to jump into crowdfunding a little bit because I know if, when I sat down with you, um, you know, you're not the typical crowdfunding guy. You have all these guys, millennials, 30s and 40s, getting into it with technology and all. What drew you to crowdfunding and what did you see that really, you know, made you get out of multifamily and focus on this specifically? Well, when I built my company back in the 90s, I did it the old fashioned way through private placement memorandums, PPMs. Mm -hmm. They cost you fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a piece, thirty days to register them with the SEC. You can only uh, solicit friends, clients, CPAs, attorneys, pass the hat at the cathedral or the synagogue. You know, you had a lot of restrictions on how you could raise money. Kind of like the current five hundred six B offerings, mm -hmm. uh, you can't generally solicit. But in nineteen, uh, I'm sorry, two thousand twelve, Obama passed the Jobs Act. And it really blew open the floodgates for general solicitation. So when I saw that you could now generally solicit for the sale of real estate securities, this was the greatest thing since the CMBS invention by Ethan Penner. Okay, it's wow. So I sat back for about a year, unfortunately, because the, the, the industry took off so fast that four or five companies that got in 12 months ahead of me became the 800-pound gorilla overnight. So when I saw the general solicitation of real estate opportunities, I immediately dropped what I was doing and I learned about the crowdfunding industry from inside out. Uh, we did a white label uh, the first 18 months, which was uh, unfortunately a, a disaster in terms of the technology because something would break on my site and we'd have to reach out to New York, then we'd reach out to San Francisco, then reach out to India, and I put in the queue, and next thing I know, 48, 72 hours later, I'm finally getting fixed. So I made the decision to build my company once again and vertically integrate it. So we built uh, a, a complete digital marketing team with uh, millennials. Uh, I built my, brought back my original underwriting team, real estate underwriting team. So now we're vertically integrated. So the ability to reach out digitally and promote my deals, my site, to tens of thousands of people in a matter of minutes is something historically you've never been allowed to do. 
So overnight, you can push out deals, opportunities. And we're a site where we host deals. We're a portal, host deals for third-party sponsors. And uh, they pay us a fee to underwrite their deals and push out and raise capital for them. So just the fact that technology has allowed us to reach out to tens of thousands of investors you know, at a moment's notice is what, uh, why I matriculated into the crowdfunding industry. It's staggering. That's awesome. That's one of the big pros. Can you give me a couple other pros of crowdfunding and maybe some cons, some negatives of crowdfunding? Well, let me tell you about the negative. The neg there is a big negative. Uh, and in fact, the ULI, Urban Land Institute, came out yesterday with an interesting article. The, the biggest downside of crowdfunding is, once again, as you said, Gino, the millennials matriculated to it. And you've got a lot of technology folks, smart, in technology, running real estate crowdfunding sites. And as the ULI said, you need at least 10 years of experience to be able to underwrite a real estate opportunity correctly and have the right intuition, the right feel for a deal. And there's a lot of intuitiveness into this industry, as you know. So I see a lot of the, the sites that are out there today not manned with the correct real estate acumen, if you will, and experience. So that is a huge con. The pro is, is obviously we're able to uh, reach out to tens of thousands of investors with the, you know, at a moment's notice um, and collect their capital. And on my portal, as in most portals, an investor can come to your site and all of the due diligence material is uploaded and everything's there for them to make a prudent business decision and even go so far as going through the accreditation process, which is our exclusion, the file six C Title II exclusion. We only have accredited investors. So all that is seamless and transparent on a crowdfunding site as in our site. So they can review a deal, review the, the intricacies of a deal, the sponsor's background, look at the videos, the photos, look at the bios. They can pledge immediately. The pledge is nothing more than a placeholder. They immediately go through the accreditation process. Then they can fund. And once they fund and we close the deal, there's a quote unquote dashboard that they can watch the deal day in and day out in real time, what their yields are, how much they invested, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's probably one of the coolest things I've seen since I got into this business 40 years ago. So let me ask you, what's going to happen with the old timers who have been doing syndications forever and this, is, this disrupt, disruption is coming, you're with this crowdfunding, what's going to happen to those guys? Are they just going to go by the wayside? Are they going to have to adapt your, your technology? How, how do you see that plan working it's, out? That, that's a great question. And I didn't ask you to ask that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I just I just thought about it because I got a guy like you in your I wouldn't say advanced age, but you're you know, you've been doing it for 40 years and you just jump in head first. And it takes a certain type of person to do that. An entrepreneur to see the um, this is all about technology. You're not a technology guy. You're a real estate guy. So for you to take that that leap into it is just because you're an entrepreneur. You see it. But there's a lot of guys out there who are stuck in their way and I don't know how they're going to get out of their way. Yeah, you know, in retrospect, truth be told, I don't know if I do it again because the technology is, is overwhelming. All right, mm -hmm. I, I brought in some really smart kids, millennials that, are, you know, when you go to my site, it's nice, it's beautiful. We wrote every line of code, we. They wrote every line of code there. <laughs> and it works like a fine-tuned piece of machinery. But let me answer your question. We started out, I started out by saying we have another platform or two. So a couple of weeks ago, we introduced the Realty Evest Marketplace. The marketplace is for sponsors, as you suggested, the old time, I mean old time sponsors, but sponsors that use the traditional methods of writing PPMs, uh, calling, dialing for dollars, having internal registered investment advisors and, and so on. What we've done with our marketplace is we basically unbolted our front end and taken their front end and bolted it onto our technology. So we basically become their back office technology department. So we offer sponsors the ability to, uh, we uh, upload all of their data. They can push that data as, in, as on my site, identically out to their thousands of investors. Their investors can go to their site, which uses all of our bells and whistles, all of our technology, and they can review their deal they can look at all the documentation. They can execute. Everything's fully automated. And they can get, they can pledge. They can get accredited. They can fund into the sponsor's escrow accounts, close the transaction. And the cool thing about this is we have a customized CRM, customer. Uh, it's, a, it's a platform in which the sponsors can see who's investing, when they invest, how much they invested, where they are in the pledging process, the accreditation process, how much they invested, et cetera. 
In addition to that, they also get a dashboard. So they have real-time data at their fingertips, how much has been invested, how much has been pledged, et cetera, how much is sitting in the escrow account. So we basically give them their entire crowdfunding technology, but their face, their website in front of it. So that's where this is going. And we work hand in hand. So it's not a white label program. I, we upload all the information. We're their partners, okay, during this offering. So we offer the marketplace for one deal. We develop their website, their offering page. We also push that out to our 15,000 accredited investors in addition. So we become supplemental capital for them. Mm -hmm. They become the primary source of capital raising with their investors, but they use our technology. How do you pre screen these deals as far as once you get on, you've got Jake and Gino and 30 other investors going out there. How, how do you look at the deals and choose deals to get onto your platform? That's the advantage of having been in the business for 40 years. Okay, we know all the moving parts. We can look at a multifamily deal and in eight hours, we can tell you every moving part better than the sponsor knows it. So a lot of it's innate, a lot of it's intuitiveness. We understand the ratios. We know where to go to get the comps. So we, we pull the comps, we pull background checks on the sponsors, okay? Uh, and I've been caught more than once, which, you know, shame on me, uh, but it doesn't happen anymore. So we, we do a great background check on the sponsors, make sure that, you know, they are who they are, who they say they are. They've, they've got experience. Uh, they've closed a lot of deals. If we look at all the line items, we look at the asset, we underwrite the asset, we underwrite the, the physical plant, and we also underwrite the community. So it's a seven day process for us to onboard a deal. So we, and, and this is key, we invest, Realty Evest, invests in every deal that's on my site. So our investors know that if it's on my site, Dan and Gene Summers have invested, will invest in this deal, All right? So we're very careful with, and they, I'm telling you, there's no one else in the industry that does that. So- uh, Yes, I like that, that's the um, skin of the game. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the name of the game. I, I, I agree with that. How do, you, how do you get users to sign up as accredited investors? How do, you, uh, how do you get guys to get onto your platform? Well, that, that's where general solicitation comes in. It's pretty cool. We have a national advertising company uh, out of Irvine, California, that build our national footprint, our national brand. So we do a lot of blogging. We do write a lot of articles. Uh, we have an, an organic and uh, paid uh, digital marketing campaign. So we do the typical stuff, okay? But you know the the paid the paid marketing uh, keywords, uh, SEO, etc. But then we do a lot of uh, we get a lot of press releases. We get picked up by the press quite a bit. Uh, we do a lot of conferences. Um, a lot of our investors, if not a majority of our investors, are self-directed IRA holders uh, because of the passive income nature of the investment. So I do a lot of conferences and webinars with self-directed IRAs. So we'll uh, I'll stand in front of 300 uh, self-directed IRA holders and uh, explain crowdfunding. Uh, and the original name of the company, this is funny, the original name of the company was IHT Realty. And no one can really buy into IHT Realty. It's like, you know, Marcus and Millichap, you know, what do you guys do, sell houses? And eventually I was standing in front of a group down at uh, Orlando and I was talking about uh, IHT Realty and crowdfunding and I brought up, you know, E-Trade. And all of a sudden it was like a light went off. It was no longer deer in the headlights. They, they identified with E-Trade with the crowdfunding. So we came back immediately and we changed the name, rebranded to Realty Evest. And now there's a bridge between E-Trade and Evest. It's the electronic investment uh, into our opportunities between pickleball games. So it's, it's kind of fun. Dan, if I had told you 20 years ago that you'd be being on webinars and, and technology, would you believe me 20 years ago? I'd say you're nuts. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but 20 years ago, I would have stayed retired, too. <laughs> <laughs> No, Just the question, mind. I think. Ten years wow. ago, there was no iPhones, right? Yeah, it's true. Where, where, where are we going to be in ten years from now? I know where I'm going to be on a boat somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's I have, a couple, I have a couple of questions. Just one other about the platform. Then I want to ask you where you want to go with the company. But what type of assets do you normally like to sponsor on the platform? So uh, I talk a lot about uh, Urban Land Institute (ULI). Um, and I tend to follow their trends. Every year they put out a 100-page document that's the trend for 2017, for example. And some of the, the trending real estate uh, asset class is obviously um, assisted living, okay, with 12,000 baby boomers retiring every day, all right? Um, 
the assisted living is definitely here to stay for decades. It's not a flash in the pan. It's going to be here for years and years and years and years. So we subscribe to the assisted living. Uh, we like affordable housing. Okay, there are some neat things being done in that space. Uh, I know we represent one of the larger affordable housing uh, developers, and what they're doing is going in and, and buying uh, these mobile home parks, for the lack of a better name, and they're renovating them, bringing them back up to 2017 standards with all the goodies, the, the amenities with pools, security, landscaping, et cetera. So, and they're selling them to the, to the retirees, if you will, on a five-year amortization schedule and they can pay off this new mobile home, if you will, which is nice, okay, over five years, and it's cheaper than paying rent. So for keep in mind, there's over 47% of the people retiring do not have any savings. They have to live on Social Security. That's a, that's a big metric right there. So the combined revenue between a husband and wife might be $3,000 plus or minus, and when you have a... Uh, a mobile home park that's really nice uh, with all the bells and whistles and your, your mortgage payment is $750. It's pretty attractive to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and of course, well, multifamily. So there's a mismatch in the industry, in the industry right now uh, for housing. You've got millennials that can't afford the houses that are being built. The, the sweet spot right now for developers is $400,000 plus uh, not enough, $150,000, $200,000 houses. So, Nice, high-end, multifamily, I think, is definitely an asset that millennials uh, can afford. And certainly uh, uh, baby boomers that are looking to move down are looking for nice multifamily. Um, millennials have issues with student loans. They have issues with credit. They have a little down payment. So the multifamily uh, is definitely a market uh, to that, that is going to continue trending. In areas like Gainesville, where there, it's called suburban, you've got a little bit of urban, a little bit of suburban. You can get up and you can walk to your bank, walk to your job, walk to the movies, walk to dinner, etc. So markets like Knoxville and, and, and Chattanooga or Gainesville or Mobile, those kind of markets, uh, I think, are, are perfect for multifamily suburban kind of developments. I like that. Where do you see your company? What do you see, I guess, the future of your company? Where do you want to take it to? You know, technology continues to grow, and and so I, I you know, it, it, the light of my crystal ball went out a long time ago. Uh, so I don't know where technology is going to take us, but I know that growth is key. Uh, we haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg in the crowdfunding industry, not even close. Uh, there's a huge void with the larger sponsors, as you suggested, Gino. Uh, the big guys, you know, are still doing it the old traditional way. So with my marketplace, I'm going to grow that. Uh, you know, uh, that's kind of our priority right now is to grow that. But I think uh, over the next three to five years, we can grow it to the point where uh, we're going to see someone from Wall Street start buying some of these these companies. Uh, but eventually, you're going to see this non-traditional method of raising capital for debt and or equity, replacing the traditional methods. Uh, keep in mind, the, the, the person in the you know $150,000 Maserati in a 60-foot yacht is not the person that's doing the, that's investing. It's the person that's running the hedge fund. So there's something wrong with that. Why am I why am I paying this guy this much money to manage my capital? He's out in this huge yacht. So at the end of the day, when an investor can invest in real estate opportunities, as an example, at their kitchen table without paying any fees, which we don't collect, our fees are all paid by the sponsors. And these are intelligent people because they're accredited, and needs to say, that's going to replace the traditional methods of hiring an investment advisor and paying them a fee to, to invest their own personal capital. I was in a meeting yesterday, a very smart individual talking similar about a similar industry. And it seems as if what he said to me, and it makes sense in this industry, there's a lot of guys out there that first start out, they might make a killing, but then you got the big boys, like you said, Wall Street coming in. Do you see that happening where you're going to have tons of crowdfunding platforms and then you have three or four guys like the big Philip Morris's of the world come in and buy you out? Is that what you foresee happening in this industry yeah. also? Absolutely. And they'll ruin it, just like everything else, just like the CMB. <laughs> it's greed. Greed drives Wall, Wall Street, right? Mm -hmm. right? Just follow the cycles. Keep in mind, there's, there's no plateaus in real estate. Right? This is still real estate. Technology or not, it's still real estate. It gets back to 
investing in real estate. There's no plateaus in real estate. There's peaks and there's valleys. And we're riding a peak right now. So Wall Street's going to get on it. And they are just going to gobble up every decent site that's out there. And greed will drive it once again into a debacle and it'll collapse. And it'll rebound, rebound and so on. So it's cyclical like everything else. And greed drives Wall Street. Wow. Last question before we get to these short answers. Uh, what's your best crowdfunding tip for the listeners? Um, it's an important one, actually. Twofold. A, make sure you look at the sponsors closely. Make sure they're experienced. B, look at the crowdfunding site. Make sure these are real estate guys driving this real estate crowdfunding site, not millennials, okay? Too much can slip through the cracks. There's a lot of money to be lost in this industry, as we all know. So look at the experience of the sponsor. Look at the, the experience of the the people that run this crowdfunding company. It's not technology, it's real estate. Very cool. Guys, let's take a quick break before we get to the short answers section um, to discuss our sponsor, and that's CrowdStreet. And CrowdStreet believes that investors of all sizes should have access to quality commercial real estate investment opportunities. The CrowdStreet marketplace features vetted commercial real estate investment offerings from over 100 sponsors from across the U.S., Download a free copy of their commercial real estate investing guide at crowdstreet.com backslash wheelbarrow. Dan, there's a question I've been you know, wanting to ask you this, this whole show, and that is in the multifamily space, can you tee up the type of product that you think is going to do the best long term, kind of asset class? Price range is tough because it varies from market to market. Um, you know, customer service. What do you, what do you envision for uh, – a multifamily uh, type product that does the best long term? Um, I have to answer that by suggesting that the market is probably the most important driving factor when making that decision. Okay. So I would look at a market, as I suggested earlier, the kind of a suburban kind of market where there's a blend of, um, you know, an urban environment, um, not necessarily downtown. Uh, but perhaps on the outskirts. Uh, so once again, you can walk to work, walk to, et cetera. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I think it's a, a class A multifamily uh, operation. Uh, you've got millennials that want to buy, but for one reason or not, they can't, but they are starting to make some money. So they're making 60, 70,000 a year. And you have the, the, the baby boomers moving down but they don't want to move down to a class B property in a class B community. Uh, this, so they still want to be able to get around and go eat dinner, go to the movies. They want to live in a nice, you know, $1,500 a month apartment or $1,000 a month apartment. So I would say a class A, class A minus in kind of an, uh, a, you know, an urban kind of uh, market, a collegiate kind of market, if you will. That's what I'm looking at personally. And that's got legs. That's got some long term legs to it. Dan, you haven't. Uh, is it a coincidence you haven't mentioned anything up in the Northeast or in the, on the West Coast, or you just stay away from those markets, like Jake and I do? Or is there a reason why you don't like those markets? Well, uh, no, I love the markets. I'm from Chicago, born and raised. I love it. But is, buying in Chicago is like buying in uh, Miami. All right, but you also have that additional line item that I don't like, and that's snow shoveling. <laughs> <laughs> You're dealing with the climate, the cold, and the the moving parts that come with the cold. Mm -hmm. The West Coast, the West Coast is too much crazy money out there. They're overpaying for everything. So, you know, I like I like where I'm at. OK, I got to figure it out. West Coast has got a lot of silly money out there and uh, a lot of Asian money going out to the West Coast. You can't compete with the European capital. They're just putting money over here. They're not looking for yields. It's the same thing in the, in the Northeast and in, 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 you know, Boston, New York, Chicago, a lot of silly money going up there. Uh, I understand the Southeast. There's no line item like snow shoveling or air conditioners to to work with. So it's easier to define, and it's my backyard. Gotcha. What is your best habit for success, something that you do on a weekly or daily basis that's uh, led to your success? You know, um, <laughs> Warren Buffett once said, uh, the smartest thing he's ever done was come to the conclusion that he needs to read 80% of his time every day, every day, seven days a week. So, you know, he's a pretty smart guy. So I try to read about 60%, 65% of my day is utilized reading something that's industry and industry driven is a big you know, pool of, of opportunity. But I try to read about 65 to 70% of my, my day 
whether it's about deals or whether it's about just you know information, market information, et cetera. And that allows you to make good, sound business decisions. I mean, informa inf my, my decisions are information driven and I have to go to a place to find that information and that's, that's where I spend my time. Very cool. And, and we hear that a lot from folks on the show. You know, I think the guys that are really successful are, are put in the work and they're, they're lifelong learners and, the, and they're doing it through, you know, day in, day out. Uh, what, you know, with that being said, what is, uh, what is the best book that you could rec recommend to the listeners? Uh, my son just sent me a book about six months ago called Tools of the Titans by Tim Ferriss. Cool book, man. It's like yo big, yeah. yeah it is, <laughs> it is. And yeah, it is. It's uh, yeah. And what I like about it is, it, I like Ferris first of all. He's a pretty cool guy. But he says, you know, you're not going to read every one of these, you know, these chapters or these stories, but pick and choose. And it's a it's a wide variety of billionaires that, and jillionaires that he interviews, and they talk about their habits. They talk about you know uh, the routines, uh, et cetera. And if you could pick, and I, I tell you what, I was reading this one time uh, this past summer, a chapter in my book, in this book, next to my pool, having a cold one, and something came, it just hit me. Wow, this is phenomenal. I got up and I went into my, my office in my house and I typed out a, a quick memo to a couple of my guys. And that turned into uh, part of my tipping point, if you will. It was just one of those lights that clicked off in my head. So little, little bits of, I don't remember what it was, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> there was a little tidbit that came out. Dan's holding back and, on us. Oh, you know what it was? <laughs> you know what it was? You know what it was? It's really cool. It was uh, how you respond to emails. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, thank you for registering to my site. It was like, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity that you've afforded us to get to know you a little bit better. I have brought in all 500 of my employees to read your registration. It was kind of fun. So it wasn't just a straight two-line sentence. It was kind of like a quasi-paragraph that uh, answered, the, uh, answered the fact that they registered to my site, and it was a cute way to, to thank them for registering on my site. Cool. Cool. Yeah. What project are you excited about right now? The Marketplace. We've just launched it. Uh, the response has been staggering by some of the who's who in the industry. We've already it's only we've only started this two weeks ago. We started building the marketplace 90 days ago. We kicked out the first national press release the beginning of last week. We've already signed up a, a number of national and regional clients. Uh, we feel that this is uh, this is the future. This is certainly the future of Realty eBest. Certainly the future of technology for the bigger sponsors. The, the fact that it's hard to get into the space. It takes a long time to write the code. It's a lot of money. Uh, and, and it's six months of your life. You can get into it almost overnight using my marketplace. So it's it's pretty cool. I think the reason it's so important, you know, we use property management software for our management company, right? We need we need some type of uh, product there to manage the relationship between uh, our business and our tenants, our customers. But when you're raising money, there's no it's no different. You need that software there. You need that that uh, go between for you and your customers, which are your investors. So, you know, for Gino myself, I think this is, this is a big need in the industry and I think you'll be uh, very successful with it. So nice, nice job there. Um, Thank you. What is the, uh, what is the best way for listeners to get a hold of you or your company? Well, strangely enough, I feel all my own phone calls. Okay. Uh, so I get phone calls seven days a week, literally. And I was on the phone 10 o'clock last night with someone out of Portland. Um, so, uh, the company is Realty Evest. Uh, the site is realtyevest.com. Uh, my email is D, as in Dan, D Summers, S U M M E R S, at realtyevest.com. And cell number, direct cell number is 904 501 7693. That's a real man right there, Gino, willing to put out the digits on the. On the Dude, the seven right? days a week. I love that. You know, it's funny. Seven, I saw baby. I saw a Cardone thing says, if you're not a millionaire, you shouldn't be taking weekends off. I don't know what Dan maybe should be taking those weekends off, but it's not about the money, my friend. It's about, about, about making it happen. Right, Jake? That is awesome. Uh, that's, that's really so, cool. So what I really loved about this show is, you know, you can tell when you're speaking to a guy who's been there and done that. And I, and I just, Dan has been a wealth of knowledge. I love the real estate experience. I think that was my favorite part about the show because look, you know, someone else that's doing it, you can, you can tell when they've been there and done that. So Dan, really appreciate your time on the show today. And Dan, there's another thing. We haven't gotten into the prosciutto, into farming or anything. So, I mean, if somebody wants to learn more about Dan's background, hit him <laughs> up. 
um, because he's got a lot of great stories. I mean, he's been through the, I guess, how many market cycles? Five or six. So he oh, knows the ups and the downs. And I've got the scars. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I really appreciate you taking the time out uh, on the show. I had a great time. And guys, hit them up. Um, if you're looking to put a deal up there, if you're looking to invest some funds, um, like he said, it's all about the sponsors. He's got the experience. He's got the young guys making the technology happen. And we thought this was going to be a technology call. But, I mean, this is definitely one of the better multifamily calls we've had. Somebody on. Hit them up if you guys need any information. Dan, I appreciate the call today. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Ciao. Take care. We trust that you enjoy the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.